I'm privileged this afternoon to be with Senator Bob Hall here at the Texas Capitol and we're going to talk about a, a very important topic, one that hopefully everyone is familiar with, but possibly if not, let, we want to bring you up to speed. And EMP, Electromagnetic Pulse, Senator, can you start filling us in on what on earth that is, why it's important, and what we need to know? Well, I sure can, because um, my experience with the, the phenomenon of the electromagnetic pulse, which is a pulse is generated when they detonate a nuclear weapon above the Earth's atmosphere, and the gamma rays interact with the Earth's um, air particles in, in the atmosphere, and collide with the magnetic field, it'll induce huge electric currents in uh, anything electrical or metal. And my exposure to this and my path from that time to now is, is definitely a God-led, God-driven changes in my life because I was first introduced to this phenomenon not long after uh, the a test were conducted called uh, Starfish Prime in 1962 when the U.S. and Russia's uh, nuclear programs had gotten such large weapons they had to go somewhere other than the desert floor uh, to test them, so they tried outer space. Now they knew there would be a phenomenon of an electromagnetic pulse, but they greatly underestimated how intense that would be. Mm -hmm. So when they started, started the testing, launching a nuclear weapon about 250 nautical miles into space, detonating it, of course there were no kinetics, no physical feel from it. It was just, it was just a bright light in space uh, just for a couple of uh, nanoseconds. But uh, the unexpected phenomenon was the knocking out of the power grids in the islands. Well, at the same time Russia was doing their testing over uh, Kazakhstan and knocking out the power systems on the ground so they, could, they couldn't continue the testing. We knew we couldn't continue, but we didn't know what each other knew, so we ended in, hmm. entered into a high-altitude nuclear test ban treaty very quickly without a whole lot of discussion, which surprised a lot of people. Well, out of that, uh, the folks at the Pentagon, particularly DIA, Defense Intelligence Agency, realized that this was a weapon that they had not counted on, and it was a weapon that the Russians could use against the United States and we kind of had our hands tied because of our difference in technology. Well, when they discovered this, I happened to be uh, a project officer on the Minuteman missile program hmm. out in San Bernardino, California, a place I should have never, ever been. Uh, it was my plan when I graduated from the Citadel to go to flight school. I was going to be a hotshot fighter pilot, and that was my <laughs> life's goal. But God had other ideas. So when I took my final physical, I didn't pass. I had 20-25 vision, and so I could not go to flight school, but they offered me a, a, a position or assignment in California. And so I arrived out at, uh, at the uh, Ballistics uh, Missile Division at that time is what it was called, later called Space and Missile Systems Organization, to uh, report for duty in July of 1964. And when I arrived, they looked at me and said, what are you doing here? And I said, I'm assigned here. That's what my orders say. They said, well, that's not supposed to happen. You're a second lieutenant, and we don't accept second lieutenants for assignments here, particularly engineers. And they would only accept senior captains and majors with advanced degrees. I said, well, I didn't write the orders. I would just hand it to, them, to me. Uh, so they didn't know what to do with me at first. But after about three weeks of interviewing, I finally found a project officer who was willing to uh, give up a slot. Most of the colonels did not want to give up a slot to a second lieutenant because any of you have been in the military, you kind of know how worthless a second lieutenant really is. And so uh, with Minuteman being a high priority program uh, on a very fast track, they were very selective. But anyway, I, I started work uh, working in the ground electronics. Uh, side of the Minuteman Missile Development Program. That's where, the, where we had the launch facilities, launch control facilities, security systems, power system, and so on. And the other side of the program office was the missile itself. Uh, that was the airborne side. I was in the ground side, but the missile was in another major office. But about 1967, 
some folks from the uh, Pentagon came out and informed the SPO that we had a whole new threat to Minuteman that uh, was serious and we had to find a fix for it. And the problem was, was our susceptibility to the electromagnetic pulse that it could destroy the Minuteman in flight. Now up until that time, our main survival mode for Minuteman was, its, was it was hardened and dispersed, very what, hard what silos. Is, let me ask you about Minuteman, for those that may not okay. know or understand exactly what that is. Sure. Minuteman was, a, uh, was the Air Force's land-based strategic uh, missile system that was designed to live, deliver nuclear weapons to our enemies. We, we deployed a thousand of them throughout the central and western part of the United States. Uh, and, and I got there just as we were transitioning, I got to the program office just as we were transitioning from Minuteman 1 to Minuteman 2 and then on to Minuteman 3 as we had upgrades. And in order to, uh, it was as part of the arms race with the okay. Russians. Okay. And our main mode of survival, so with MAD, which is mutually assured destruction, meant that we had to be able to absorb a fairly large attack and be capable of retaliating so that the other side, neither side could win. That was a strategy that kept us from ever going to war. It was one of the most brilliant things we ever did because it resulted in actually never having a war take place with the, with the Russians. But at that time, when we found out that rather than having to target each of our thousand missiles individually, they could launch a, a, weapon, a, a nuclear weapon into outer space, detonate it, and they could kill multiple uh, missiles in flight. And wow. so we were at a huge disadvantage because we were susceptible to this threat, but the Russians were not. And that was because we were so far ahead of them in technology our onboard computer systems for the Minuteman were made with integrated circuits. The Russians used vacuum tubes, which were not susceptible to the EMP uh, hmm. threat. So after some problems with the program, the general who was uh, General Ken Schultz at the time uh, reorganized and said, uh, we have to get this project finished, so we're going to take a different course and in doing that, I got assigned to be the project manager. I should have never, ever been assigned that because I was in the ground system, had nothing to do with the missile, but because of the work I had done and kind of being a go-to person for solving problems, I was tagged to be the project manager. And so I did and uh, took charge of it. The difficult part really came when uh, this I was just a junior captain, just made captain, but my team that I had to lead was made up of nine lieutenant colonels or colonels. And so with a junior captain in charge of colonels, it, uh, it got off to a kind of a rough start. But we got things worked out and a few weeks we were on track and uh, a few months later uh, back on schedule. And when I uh, left the Air Force, decided to go into industry, uh, the system was well on its way to being deployed. And we were back on par with, uh, with our system with the Russians, but it was so, so highly classified that I never spoke to anyone, never told anybody, my family never knew what I did, what I worked hmm. on. And so I went about a good part of my life uh, with my own small business, and then after I retired back in 2008, I saw a magazine at a doctor's office, and in the, the cover of the magazine was EMP threat to the U.S. electric grid. Wow. And that got my attention. I said, wow, what are they talking about? Because in the 60s, we had not thought about the threat to the electrical grid because power, electrical power in those days was really more of a luxury than an absolute necessity to life. <laughs> and as we know today, electricity yeah. is the third most important thing to sustaining life. The only two things more important are air and water because there are a lot of people that will live longer without uh, uh, food than they will without electricity. And so I read the article and thought it was very kind of interesting, but it mentioned a, a uh, White House commission on EMP that had put out a report. So I decided, uh, well, this has piqued my interest. I sent for a copy of it and I got it. I read it. I uh, found it to be a mesmerizing document. And when I got through reading it, I looked to see who had written it because I said, These, whoever wrote this really knew what they were doing. 
Well, to my surprise, there were some of the same people that I'd worked with oh, in the Air Force wow. that had actually written, been part of this study. And I thought that was good, but didn't think any more about it. And then a few weeks later, uh, I was at a conference, an education conference, where I was talking about the, the evils of uh, socialism that's being taught in a program called C-Scope. And there was a gentleman there from Washington, D.C. by the name of Frank Gaffney, who was also speaking on the same subject. And uh, in a side conversation, he started talking about the problems he was having on something else in Washington, and it turned out to be trying to get Congress to harden the electrical grid because of the EMP threat. And it tweaked my interest, and we talked about it a little bit, and then parted ways and nothing came of it. Yeah. Uh, in the meantime, I had gotten very active in the Tea Party, or was active in the Tea Party, and gotten to the point where I was had decided that I was going to run for office. And I met another gentleman that was associated with Frank Gaffney by the name of uh, Dr. Peter Pry. And the subject came up again, and he pointed out to me that Texas had, had its own electrical grid system, and if I got elected, I should do something about trying to protect Texas. And so that's exactly what I ended up doing when I decided to actually run for office. And uh, so what that, a that is my background. What a story. How, well, it's um, how, it's how that came full circle for you there. Help people understand why EMP would knock out an electrical grid and the impact of what that would be. Well, it's not just an EMP. Uh, we're okay. tied together. Is the threat we have is not just man-made, but it's also natural. There's a the natural mm -hmm. phenomenon is called a GMD, uh, uh, ground uh, magnetic disturbance, okay. geomagnetic disturbance, and that occurs with what's called generally called sunspots or coronal mass ejections from the sun, which are huge nuclear explosions. And they come off the sun all the time, and they're only a threat to the United States when they're aligned with our orbit. They're coming near the Earth, and we've experienced them multiple times. Uh, the, the earliest known occurred in 1859, uh, and it knocked out the um, uh, telegraph system. We didn't have electricity per se, but we did have a telegraph system. Wow. Here in the United and, and in Europe, it, it fried the telegraph system burned operators, sent several to the hospital, uh, warped railroad tracks, and set uh, railroad ties on fire. So it was very intense. Whoa. It was called the Carrington event. You can look it up, Google it. It's, uh, there's a lot been written about it. So it's, a, wow. it's an established fact. And in the modern times, uh, 1989, we had the huge blackout in the Northeast uh, that was, uh, was caused by a uh, uh, coronal mass ejection, and we've had several others besides that. But the phenomenon is a huge, very fast rising, large electrical pulse, pulse, and it comes in three phases E1, E2, and E3 is what they're referred to. Uh, each one having a different impact on electrical and electronic equipment, so that anything between the three, anything that's electrical or electronic, will be fried. Uh, most, if it's on for sure, uh, there's still a lot of studying and some question about to the extent that equipment that's not turned on might be affected, but it's expected that most of it will be damaged beyond repair. So that so, would be cars, that would be the gas pump, that yeah. would be uh, yeah. the lights in our home, uh, just everything. It's, yes, anything electrical. The pacemaker? The, a pacemaker. The millennials will go crazy initially because they will not have iPhones. Yeah. Uh, we'll have no telephone, no television, no communication. There will be no pumps running. No pumps to pump sewers, to pump fresh water, or to pump gasoline. And most modern cars are car built after about 1974 will have their ignition uh, computer burned up in them. Uh, it will be so extensive that there will be far too not possible to repair uh, M yeah. Most of them, and enough, not enough parts to do it. And, and it so, would just happen in a nanosecond. We would yes. go from being a today's world into being a third world society. That, that is correct. We would. It, it would be like being thrust back into the eighteen early eighteen hundreds instantly. And our, as we well know, we are not uh, an agrarian 
uh, society these days. So it would be a real challenge. Uh, matter of fact, a gentleman uh, uh, from uh, North Carolina wrote a book a few years back called One Second After. And True. he describes the first year in his community in uh, North Carolina after we lost all power in the United States. A very sobering book, very well written. It's a novel, but a very good reflection of what life would be like without electricity. It's something that's hard for people to imagine yeah. because we've never had a threat here. A real war fought on our shores. We've never really had, had have people living today who have had real difficulty in their life. I mean, the worst we've had in modern times was the Great Depression. Yeah. Uh, and there's not really anybody alive today that was in the Great Depression. So knowing what it's like to be without yeah. is something that people just can't quite comprehend. No. And so uh, not uh, to think about the fact that we would be thrown back where we have to operate w with absolutely nothing electrical. I was given a presentation here, uh, one of them a while back, and. Somebody made the comment, well, the Amish, they, they live without electricity. They do all their farming and everything. They would be just fine. And somebody said, and people were commenting, yes, I wouldn't. And then somebody commented from the other side of the room and says, yes, but they don't have guns. That's so right. it, it, will, it will not be good for anyone No. in there. So uh, we're working on a bill to try to protect the state of Texas to try to protect the families and businesses that are here in Texas. And we're in a unique position because of what I said earlier, Texas has its own electrical grid. In the United States, there are three major electrical grid systems. There's the Eastern, there's the Western, and then there's Texas. And Texas grid covers about 85% of the people in Texas. So we could protect our own grid if we just stepped up to do it. And when you say that, what would that mean? How, how is it not protected today? Today, there, there was nothing about our electrical grid system that was ever designed and built with the thought of any kind of security beyond a, a little bit of chain link fence here and there. Oh. Uh, that's about all there is. And we've had attacks. Uh, there, was a, there was a physical attack on a substation in San Jose, California back in the in uh, 2013 that that came within one circuit of probably knocking out the power in all of California if not in the western states wow. from a physical attack. Uh, we've had numerous times the grid has gone down due to a GMD event. Uh, and the, the mechanism for attack uh, is, is the other thing that's hard for people to comprehend because when you think about somebody attacking the United States, you, everybody immediately thinks about Russia or China with a million men and several nuclear weapons and a long exchange. Everybody thinks in terms of a, of a World War II type of siege and fight. Uh, that's not the case at all. This is, this is where we have advance so much in technology, the very thing that makes life so good for people today, that makes it uh, whatever you want done, you flip a switch or you push a button and it automatically happens, is what makes us so vulnerable to an EMP attack. And an EMP attack is not a large barrage of, of lots of aircraft and missiles and, and bombs. It's a single event. It's one nuclear weapon that gets detonated about 200, 250 nautical miles above the central part of the United States one time and that's all it takes to totally eliminate our ability to have anything electrical electronic. A, a cargo ship with a medium range missile like an SA-2 mounted on it with one nuclear weapon and about a half a dozen people could easily launch that missile so that it gets to 250 nautical miles over, over Kansas, Nebraska, no particular spot, and the lights would go out permanently in the United States. And there is good evidence that that has been well thought through. We, uh, just a few years back, we intercepted a North Korean ship coming through the Panama Canal. It had on it two SA-2 missiles and all the launch equipment that was needed. The only thing missing was a nuclear weapon. 
Wow. And we know that the Russians and the Chinese have had a, a, a preemptive EMP strike on the United States in their war plans for, for years now. When the Soviet Union collapsed, there were, were several high-ranking military officials and, and other government officials that defected to the U.S. And when they came here, they wanted to have evidence that they were worth something to the United States so they'd be allowed to stay. And so they brought all kinds of documentation oh, wow. showing that the Russians and the Chinese had planned to use a preemptive EMP attack on the United States in the event they decided to go to war. And more concerning than that was that they had in place plans to have a third party surrogate actually do it so that we would not be able to tell who had actually made the attack. Since all it takes is a handful of people and one weapon, it's not like an army mounting it up and we can tell where it came from. Well, and if everything's knocked out, we yeah. wouldn't have the means to even do the re research back to right. track it, would we? That is correct. We have very little standby power in, in our military bases around the country. Our, our military, for the most part, is totally dependent on the electrical grid system that uh, we use uh, for the civilians and commercial. And that's one of the reasons that, uh, that this past summer uh, I was contacted by the military who now recognizes that this is a serious threat to the United oh, States. Oh, good. <laughs> and that military is located right here in Texas. It's headed up by a general who uh, commands all of the military bases in Texas and heads the Air University. And as I understand it, he's on the short list. To be a command, to be the commander for space space force. Command. Oh, okay. And he recognizes the threat to our grid system, and he wants to do something about it. So I was invited back to a three-day conference in Washington to hear presentations from various parts of the military and uh, uh, and, and other parts of the government. I could not attend all the sessions because I don't have a security clearance now, but what yeah. I did attend, it was obvious that they're taking this very serious Good. and want to do something to protect the, the U.S. And this ge general uh, wants to start with Texas. So our grid is solely confined within Texas, Can't, is, but it's networked, isn't it, with the others as well? No, or no, no. It is it isolated. We are, we, are, we are isolated. There are parts of Texas that the other grids from the west and the east side come into Texas, okay. up around the Panhandle area in particular, and some on the east part of Texas. But we are isolated from them. We can secure the Texas electrical grid. It's not complicated. Good. Other countries have done it. The technology is there. We know what to do. We know what is needed to protect the high voltage transformers, which were a several thousand tons. Uh, take 24 to 36 months to have them built, and we don't even build them here in the United States. We have to go to Germany or another foreign country to actually buy them. Uh, we know what oh, to wow. do to protect our, our SCADA systems, the control systems. We actually have power companies that have built uh, protected SCADAs, and the cost was, was almost insignificant to build them to the military specs. Uh, and so it's not anything that's cost prohibitive to do. But one of the things that the power companies who, who have been, they, the power companies can, can take sole ownership of the fact that we have not done anything to date to protect our electrical grid system. Unfortunately, they are owned, run by, by executives who are more concerned with their paychecks and their bonuses than they are about protecting the people of Texas. And so they have fought doing anything for several years now including putting out false reports mm. and having organizations like uh, EPRI and NERC and FERC, which are, which are really uh, shills for the power company, putting out uh, studies and analysis that show that nothing is, is actually needed to be done, which is absolutely one of the farthest things from the truth. Uh, but they're one of their major op oppositions to it has been that, well, it wouldn't matter if the power company survived because no one would be able to use their power. Uh, so there, there, is some, there is some truth to that. And so one of the things we have done this session is we have listened to the stakeholders. We listened to what the power companies had to say. 
One of the things they said was, we're, we're, we're doing what's needed to be done. Don't, don't worry about us. We'll take care of it. We're doing it. And the other is, uh, well, it won't make any sense if, if all the other industry like fuel supply and water and sewer and medical and financial, if they don't do something to protect themselves, we won't have a society anyhow. So we listen to that. Mm -hmm. And so our bill this session to protect Texas encompasses those things. Matter of fact, the focus of what we're doing is what it's really all about anyhow, and that's protecting the economy of Texas, protecting the people of Texas. And so what we have now is, is what we're calling resilient communities for sustainable economic prosperity. That's what it's about, is protecting peoples and families and businesses. And so we're doing it in a holistic way to encompass not only the power company's concerns, but the real fact that we do have to have everybody involved. So our approach this time is to operate uh, the, lead, the lead agency is going to be our emergency services folks. Mm, uh, right. They, they will, will establish a, a commission within them that will be made up of, of members from industry and government, the stakeholders involved to make the major decisions on what's to be done. We'll establish uh, some specific uh, dates and levels of protection for the major components of the power system that need to be met by the power companies and include in there with them the fuel supply so that they will have the wherewithal of what they need to be able to operate. Now, that will be established in the bill, but in the commission that, that, that we'll have set up, we will also allow the power companies to submit their own plan. If they feel they cannot meet the dates and levels that are specified, in the bill, they will be able to submit an alternate plan to this broad uh, commission, okay. and if that gets approved, then they will be able to op to start the work and do the work based on how they think they can accomplish it. Now, what kind of time frame would we be looking at from today to the point where well, we would be protected? Well, be protected has got a very broad definition to it and it's the level of protection. What we'll ultimately be looking at, I don't think we'll ever get to where the lights don't go out for some extent, but what we want to get to is where we have a controlled rolling brownout. So as we're recovering, uh, people, because you're talking about a very short time period for people on medication mm -hmm. without refrigeration are seriously right. in trouble. Uh, and so we're looking at uh, getting it where we can have reasonable recovery time and and that's part of what we're working on but to do this what we're looking at we're going to call that a resilient community when they when they have the power system with the with the fuel supply well underway to to be in uh, protected they'll be identified as a resilient community and it is as that community works with the other entities such as uh, health care services, emergency services, uh, uh, clean water, sewer, financial, they will gain a star on their resilient communities. Tell the ultimate would be a five star resilient community. And they would be identified as such. Just like what we did several many years back when communities had very poor water supply, the state stepped in and helped them with uh, getting clean. Uh, approved water supply and you still see signs up yep. today mm -hmm. that our community it is an approved uh, water uh, supply and so that's what we'd be looking at is and that would be the economic carrot that will bring businesses and people to Texas to continue the the Texas miracle of economic growth so we'd have resilient communities for sustainable economic prosperity by making sure that we survive. Now if it's a nuclear bomb that went off, how many, uh, to me I think the people are going to be gone. No, 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 okay. no, that's no. A, no. At 200 outside the atmosphere, the bomb goes off, you don't even know it went off. Okay. There will be no fallout, it would, it, really? it, the bombs cool. will kill no one, well, cool. it, won't, it won't damage anything <laughs> yeah. physically, uh, there, there's no radiation from it that affects humans. All you're going it to get is, 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 is the gamma rays that come off of mm. this bomb that that 
impinge upon the particles in the atmosphere, knocking the electrons off those particles. And those electrons interact with the Earth's magnetic field to induce huge electrical currents into things electrical and metal. That's that's if it you it'll be a bright light for just a a, a couple of nanoseconds. Does it have to be at that level, or can no. uh, you know we all? We oftentimes hear the concern about a, a suitcase nuclear kind of bomb. Would that's, that do? No, that's, that's an entirely different thing. The okay. suitcase is going to be very local, will cause damage locally. No, this is anything above the Earth's atmosphere, you know, from, from 50 uh, nautical miles on up. The higher it is, the more widespread the effect because it's line of sight. So the higher, but at, at about 250 nautical miles, it would cover the United States coast to coast and border to border, beyond border to border, hemisphere. Um, well, it's obvious from what you've shared that this is something we have got to move toward and rather disheartening that our military, you knew, they knew all that many decades ago and nothing was done. Um, so what do we need to do today to help support your work to bring this bill into fruition and to get the ball rolling? I think one of the major things is to let the power companies know that, that, that people would not mind having their electric bill raised by a few dollars per year to do that. It's not an expensive thing to do. We can do this whole thing for way less than what we spent to build Cres lines so that we could bring uh, wind-driven power from West Texas into the metropolitan areas, a fraction of what we spent on that. We could do it for about what we spend on economic development in Texas, and it would be the biggest boon to economic development we could we could see. We just get the power companies, um, like, like they told me. We, they, once they said, "Well, we we sent questionnaires out. We we've uh, quizzed our customers and asked them if they'd like to have their their rates raised." And, and everybody you says say no. <laughs> I said, well. I said, you left off half of it. What's the benefit that would go with it and how much would it be raised? They're, yeah. they're very disingenuous in the way they handle it. Mm -hmm. But the good news is that the effort the Air Force is making down in San Antonio, uh, they have brought the community together down there. As I understand it, the, the uh, city officials down there are, are anxious for San Antonio to be the initial city to start protecting its grid. And the power company, CPS, is very much on board with with, wow. the, with the idea and the military and so between the three of them I think we can get it get it started and I'm, my feeling is if San Antonio starts to emerge emerging in Texas as the place for businesses to go and families to go the other cities will wake up and get <laughs> on board with it. How will this, um, I'm from San Angelo out in West Texas, a smaller community than these big metropolis <laughs> metroplexes and all how will this type of thing affect us? Because we're probably at the end of the, the uh, power grid run or something. Well, you have a power, there, there, are, there are a huge number of power companies throughout Texas. Everything from very large ones like Encore to some very small local co-ops. Each one has its own challenge in what they're going to do and how they do it. Uh, and we expect it, that uh, it, it, to say we know the answer for everything that's going to be implemented uh, would, would really be saying that we don't expect technology to step in. We don't expect the ingenuity. And we're already seeing that. At every conference I've been to, there's somebody new has shown up and says, I look, look at what I've developed that would help this system, that would improve the efficiency. Uh, one, one group that came to us to show that that they could protect the grid and actually lower the cost of electricity at the same time. Wow. Now, whether, whether they do that or not is yet to be seen. There, there will be people that show up with ideas that don't work out, but there are a number of them out there uh, with microgrids, uh, which uh, look very promising to, to who knows what in the way of using solar, wind, in, in various ways that we don't even know about today. There are advances being made with batteries that are Today we're quantum leap above where we started out just a few years ago with, uh, with battery systems. So uh, a lot will start unfolding once uh, the inventors and the geniuses out there that 
find good solutions, realize that we're ser that we're going to seriously do something to protect the people of Texas. So it's in its infancy, and yes. all things are possible. Yes. And well, the thing about it, the good thing is, even if they didn't come through with it, we know what 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 needs to be done. There is equipment that's installed here in the United States right now with some advanced or some power companies that get it, that understand it, and they have found the benefit of it. They've got one company that has had their their transformers protected uh, with uh, neutral blocking, they, where they were used normally getting lots of equipment damaged from uh, from the GMDs, are experiencing no damage since oh. they've installed them. We've got other power companies like Duke in South Carolina nice. that realizes that 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 have some forward-thinking people. Uh, we have it in Virginia, amazing under a Democrat leadership, but we've got a power company there that says, hey. There's something to this. We need to do something about it, and we've got some aggressive ones like uh, Florida Power and Light. That uh, while they don't have an isolated grid, they could have one, and they recognize the importance of economic growth. And so the other states are going to get ahead of us if we if we keep letting the power companies make the decision that the legislature ought to be making. And this is a decision the legislature needs to make to protect the people of Texas. And this isn't new. This is that people talk, oh, we need to let the free market handle this. Well, I'll tell you that this for sure. If we'd have left the, power, the, the free market handle the, the electric power companies from the beginning, you probably would not have electricity in San Angelo today, Orlando, Texas, or Buda, or any of the other small towns around, because the power companies on their own would have only delivered power where they were making lots of money. And so there comes a time when it's, it's yeah. very appropriate. So if the government had not stepped in with the rural electrification of, of, of America, we would only have power in the big cities today. And it's not, the, and, and, and there are other times. I mean, the power companies for years knew they had problems with uh, transformers uh, shorting out mm -hmm. due to some horrific natural forces like brown tree squirrels <laughs> that would short them out. And they, they basically refused to do anything about it, let people be without power, because their solution was, well, when it happens, we'll go, we'll go replace it when we yeah. get around to it. And so One the government squirrel. finally <laughs> stepped in and came up with, spe with specs that they had to be, and for bad weather. So we have mm -hmm. along the way, government has had to step in and get the power companies to do what they should have been doing had they been responsible on their own to do it, but refused to do it. And this is just the next step in that evolution of protecting the people of Texas from what is a very real and imminent threat. And you just need to go search the internet and look at the huge number of reports that are coming out uh, and look at the, the discussions taking place. Uh, in early December, I was invited to another meeting back in Washington, D.C. with an organization called InfoGuard. InfoGuard is an FBI organization that teams with businesses for, for business security. And at that meeting, it was a two-day meeting, we had speakers that came from the White House, from Homeland Security, from the De Defense Intelligence Agency, from the FBI, uh, several parts of DOD, and others there, NSA, all discussing about the concerns of this growing threat and our need to do something about it. Because it, it's the easiest way to take down America. Yeah. Just think about it. One small nuclear mm -hmm. weapon in the hands of a half a dozen people with a just a simple old SA-2 and there are thousands of them around on the back of a cargo ship sitting off the coast of Galveston. Wow. That's all it would take. Mm. So have you already filed your bill? Does your bill have a we, number yet? We are working on it. All right, that. still yes. being drafted. Yes. Okay. Um, so when Help me on one last thing. Help me understand specifically when I know you don't have everything put together yet in the bill, but how will this bill, from a legislative standpoint, take the lead in what's needed? By by establishing the commission that's going to oversee what what's being done by putting the requirements in the bill that the power companies either meet the levels that we put in the bill or they present a plan as an alternative approach. Okay, and then the, then the rest of it is by the carrot for the communities to recognize that they 
can come together as a community and do what's needed to develop their emergency services, protect their hospital, their health uh, yes, care, yes. Uh, their financial, and, and the rest of businesses out there so that their community could be identified as a resilient community where people would want to live and stay, yeah. to raise their families and have businesses that they know they would have continuity of operation. Wow, this is a critical uh, issue for sure. Um, I really appreciate your time this afternoon and feel like we'll need to do a couple of follow-up uh, as this bill is working through and as more things develop because we need to see that this comes into fruition and quickly. Sure. Stay tuned. This, I, I really feel this is the year that we will get this done. Very good. Thank you, Senator, so much for your time. Thank you for being here. Thank you for what you do. Thank you.